everybody. Welcome back to episode 50 of That Scale RC Show. This is one of your hosts, Jeremy, along with Adam and Travis. Say hi to everybody, guys. Hello. Hello. What's up? I said hi, not what's up. Hello. Hello. Much better, thank you. <laughs> so we don't have a guest this week, um, but we kind of realized we haven't really talked a whole lot about, like, body tricks and stuff like that like lexan bodies hard body stuff so um we're kind of thinking we would do an entire episode on bodies and then uh also kind of see where that takes us so um adam how was your weekend man um well not really uh much going on i mean i i did film which i gotta figure out how to get off now um i filmed on my phone going over my setup with the SCX-10 III, um, but I haven't gotten on my computer yet, so that way I can edit it and post it. I was trying to, but for some reason, I can't find a simple way to get it off my phone. iPhone, right? Yep. I can help okay. you. Yeah, yeah, we've got actually a pretty good system for doing that now because we've both had to deal with the same type of thing. So. Yeah, so that's about it. And then, I am going to go tomorrow, I think, and uh, hopefully be able to do some video for our YouTube channel and get some pictures and some other stuff because I finally get to try my IFS build out. So that's going to be really cool. Nice. Well, I should say try it out with like a decent crawler setup, not like all super scaled out like it was because that ram charger body it wasn't super capable because that thing was really heavy because it had a lot of junk in it but that's life mm -hmm. travis what about you um well t saturday i don't remember sunday i don't really remember monday i went and did some drag test and tune oh yeah we can talk about all that yeah, too. yesterday was tuesday so tuesday i got canceled on facebook and now that brings us to here. So, yeah, it's been a good week. Nice. Yeah, I, actually, we should talk about the drag racing really quick, just while that's kind of fresh in our minds, because that was seriously fun. Yeah, I mean, I also don't know what else to say at this point, other than we're just getting a lot closer. Um I mean, we're, we're kind of getting just set up dialed in, really, because our surface is really low grip and, and not exactly flat. So we went out there Monday, and I played with I played with setup just a little bit. I played with the front, you know, body height because I have that Proline Octane body, and I think that's coming up. I think I'm going to go with the Nova, and I want to try the Super J at some point as well. Um, but that Octane is basically. It's a cool-looking body. Um, it does okay, but it is severely limiting the power I can put in that car right now as far as my throttle EPA because of the, uh, the, the amount of air that escapes through the, the wheel wells and underneath the front of it, so it basically just acts as a big wind sail on the big end. And so that's, that's hard. Um, all, I think there were three of us out there on Monday that have those bodies, and we were all fighting the same issues. Our uh, our intern has it on his, and uh, as he he was hitting intern, full throttle, that. <laughs> he was hitting full throttle pretty much at the uh, finish line of our of our um our drag area, and then it would catch air and and go up, and he probably was airborne three times in a row. Oh, he was driving ours or his own? His own. So, oh. We played with that a little bit, um, and I'm running. I've been running non-belteds. I'm gonna move to belteds. Gonna try that, and then I'm gonna play some radio stuff. But other than that, other than that, I mean, it's pretty happy with how the car is feeling. Oh, I did some stick-on weights up front too, just trying to keep that front end down a little bit. So hopefully, all these things mean that. I can start dialing at least a little bit more power on the top end of it because I noticed that with the cars. The, the issue that I'm fighting right now is that the car is kind of topping out. But if I add any more to it, then I start making my launch inconsistent and that starts to catch air underneath it. So I think it's time for a new body. I think that's, a, that's the most important thing at this point. You know what surprised me about that body is the fact that it has that gnarly air dam below the front bumper. 
and the Nova doesn't. And I honestly thought the Octane was going to work really, really good yeah, keeping the air out. But, but also look at look at the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And you know, take notice of like the wheel wells, for example. I mean, you could oh my uh, god, yeah, tires on the wheel wells. So I mean, it's just. I think what's happening is everyone is starting to trend to narrower bodies, which I like. Yeah, I like that too. So I, as that becomes a more of a thing, this issue will go away. I think that was just an issue with this body in particular. I've been hearing good things about the Nova. The Super J just is a pro mod body, which I don't really think should be a part of the Street Outlaw thing, but it's not technically illegal, so why shouldn't I try one? So, yeah, it is kind of cool looking. It's and cool it, looking is, body. It, is it narrower? Mm, it would at least be a tighter fit. Because it's kind of tall. I know it's kind of tall. It would be know, a tighter fit. I was thinking about this too, another thing that, you know, I obviously like a lot of this is very um dependent on the area that you run at you know for setup and stuff because traction's going to be different you know there's a host of all kinds of things that are going to be different with different cars but we're kind of just having to test and tune on our own and figure out what works and one of the things i was thinking about that might help a little is possibly cut out the back of the body under the wing like up to the taillight line so that some of that air can escape, you know, cause you can't do like short course body style vents in the back of it, you know, like that isn't going to work and it's, well, it might work, but it's going to look terrible. But maybe if we just get rid of that kind of pocket at the back of the body where that air would tend to gather, if it gets stuck underneath it, you know, give that some sort of a way of escaping. I mean, we have that other true. octane body. We can try Which that. Which is on. true and, and warrants a try. However, I don't really feel like that's the issue because a lot of the air is gathering at the front of it and pulling it back. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't think that it's getting trapped throughout the body and then the rear. I mean, the rear end is kind of being used as a pivot point. Um, I could see it. I could see that totally from the standpoint of maybe it would just improve overall like just top speed i could see that just a little bit less drag but i don't think it would right. solve the parachuting issue so you're riding a really fine line the other thing that you, that is paramount in all of this is that everyone does this a little bit differently and kind of uses their throttle points but if they have to pedal it or not they have to do it you know differently I, it, it, no one really does it the same so you have to keep that in mind too as far as setup. Like for example, after I handed the car off to you, you did a lot of things that like numbed down the front end and turned the dual rate down quite a bit and everything else. And then when I took it, I, I didn't like that. Oh, so gotcha. you, the car, because then the front end of the car was not nearly responsive enough for me, right? Mm -hmm. So sure. it's like it, it's, you also have that limiting factor as well as, okay, well, who's driving it and how, how do they drive? So... There's that part of it that, that we have to keep in mind. But, yeah, like I said, I think I'm going to go the body. I think that's the biggest thing right now. Um, belted's just because I, I think the expansion at the uh, the top end is what we're trying to maybe avoid. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really look like it was having, the, like, the belteds that I saw out there. They didn't really look like they were having the wear issues that I've been hearing about. So there must be something to the belteds that people might have been having issues with that I maybe am still not understanding. But, right. yeah, I mean, that's basically what's going on. So we're going to do that. going to try those. Um, and then we're just going to go from there. And obviously we'll have to fine-tune some stuff as we change those because then the car, you know, the car setup is going to feel a little bit different. So hopefully that will open up some new doors for us as well as far as uh, things we can fine-tune. But the car is really close, so I'm excited to provide updates on that later on. Yeah, no, I think that'll be awesome. Yeah. I think the one thing that we've learned through this entire process, though, has been the fact that you don't just throw them down and drive them. <laughs> like, it's not like set them down on the ground and just pull the trigger and go straight. There's, like, way more driving involved than I thought there would be. So for that reason, I, I don't know, I thought it was super, super fun when I tried it because, you know, it's... It's definitely a challenge, that's for well, sure. Another cool part of it, about it, too, is that, like, I was talking about this on my last show, is that the, like, the fast guys in, let's say, off-road racing, mm -hmm. just because they're fast there doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be fast in drag racing. It's a whole totally different group of competitiveness. 
So right. I really like, you know, about this going forward and the simplicity and the amount of time it doesn't take to do all this. So it's, I mean, it's pretty cool. And like I said, at the end of the day, it's hard. There's a lot to it, man. So you really have, to but, it, but it's a, it's fun hard though. Cause it like is, it is. that was one of the things that I really was stoked about the day, you know, the two different times that I've done the little test and tune sessions has been like, everybody's like, here, drive this, see what you think. This is what I did to it. Like there was way more, sharing of information and setup tips than you typically yeah. see with regular RC racing. And so for that reason, I thought that was pretty right. Everyone's cool. Everyone's relaxed. I mean, and then when things don't go right for you, it's either that it's pretty funny because something happened as a result of it, which is as a result of the, the, the hole in the front of my, my octane body right now on that car. <laughs> um, the prime example of that, that was pretty awesome to see. But, um, also, too, it's cool for, you know, like if you get something right, then if you have someone that's watching your runs, you know, usually everyone's giving each other feedback is like, you know, oh, well, that was a that was a good launch. It just got squirrely or things like that. Like it's all really it's a really positive environment. And that's what racing has been missing for a long time. And that's so as soon as I like I was kind of I want to do everything, you know, I kind of have a bit of a, you know, ADHD as far as RC goes. So like I'm, I'm kind of everywhere at once, but nowhere at the same time. So. Until I went out to do this drag thing, I was like, all right, well, my plan is going to do this, this, and this this summer. And then I did I did that drag night, and I was like, all right, well, <laughs> I think this is just what I want to spend my time doing. This is just this is just so much better in every way. Yeah, it was incredibly fun. Yeah, totally. I like it. It, it was just, I don't know, there was a pretty, like, strong sense of camaraderie that, I mean, we get that with racing, too, but... You know, I'm not saying like we race with like a bad crowd of people or anything. That's not really. Oh, it. There's it's a lot of just... stupid things that happen in racing that shouldn't and stuff that is not going to be tolerated in the drag scene. Yeah. And so, like the, okay. there was probably a lot more laughing and chuckles with this than way more any type of racing stuff I've done lately, which was kind of neat. Oh, man, way more, more than any other RC I've ever done. Yeah, there's some pretty spectacular crashes. There are. It's yeah. pretty fun. There are. <laughs> and you just hear it like it, it all, it's almost like anywhere you are at the park if you're in in like the vicinity of where the asphalt is, like you're just casually having a conversation with somebody and then all of a sudden you hear this yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's this car skidding down the street on I mean, a slid cool for, you know, happens. 50 feet. It's cool when it happens. It really sucks later when you have to go to make the parts order, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? but, but regardless, it, it's definitely some funny stuff, though. I love it. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your uh, scale 50 cal incident? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's see. Okay, so so one of my one of my better RC friends, Tyler, who's kind of like the the other person behind this the 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 scale drag racing thing that we've got going on he's kind of he's he's kind of the person who really knows what's going on and, and anyone who knows tyler it's like if he wants to learn about something he learns about it and he spends all this time researching and, and figuring out anything there is to know about it and so oh yeah he, you know he's way into it and so i mean he's already got like multiple cars with different bodies and stuff just trying out different things all the time and it was really cool so um, I, I wanted to see how my car stacked up against his because his truck um, he calls it El Diablo. It's this. Uh, white, oh, really? Yeah, it's white S10. I think it's his. Uh, it's his SD6 based car. It's just this white oh, okay. Concepts S10 body on it, just, and that body just seems to wor work really well and just have tons of downforce. And his car was just, his car was just perfect every time. And I was like, okay, like obviously that's where the benchmark is, right? So I want to see how my car stacks up against his. So I got either one or two passes in uh, with him where they were they were very clean passes. Um, obviously, I lost. But, you know, I was pretty surprised at how my car did do. And I was like, okay, I'm a lot closer than I thought I was, you know. And then the third one, we just, you know, the, the funny part about this is, like, you can kind of do, like, hit after hit after hit if, A, you have good electronics, and, B, you, you kind of take care of your stuff a little bit. So, you know, we a lot of times you'll just bring it back after pass, and you'll, you'll do burnout on the carpet and get right back up on the line if no one else is waiting to go. 
So I think I think Wilbur and I did that, and we put it right on the line, and someone dropped their hand or did the the flashlight on on their phone or whatever, and I went and um, I just I absolutely trashed my launch. My launch was terrible, and so we put up just kind of like a guard beam on the on the sides of the uh, either side of of this you know strip of road, and so I I went left into the guard beam and I didn't get off of it fast enough so I was kind of riding against the guard beam well it caught my tire I guess because it shot up into the air about four feet right to the top of the snow fence post that we had lining it as well and so it, it just the front of the body just smacked the top of this snow fence post that was sticking out into the to the road a little bit he just sat there and and rotated a bunch in the air, and then all of a sudden just came down on the ground super hard. And so, yeah, we put the hole. It put the hole in the front of that body. It it broke the front hinge pin uh, holder off with the left hand like the left screw. It broke the top of that out of the brass bulkhead, and then <laughs> when it landed on the ground, it pushed the motor. Somewhere along the lines, the impact, like it hit that post hard. So the impact pushed the motor and the pinion into the spur gear as, as hard as it could go. So it just knocked the whole mounting loose. So, yeah, I mean, that's basically <laughs> what happened. It was pretty awesome. So the moral is it sounds so like you zigged when you should have zagged. Uh, no, I... I I tried to save the. I should have just aborted. Is what I. There should have been no, <laughs> no zagging. I should have just. I should have launched and just been like, nope, nope. <laughs> That's what it's I should have done. surprisingly difficult to know when to shut it down so that nothing bad. Yeah, happens. well, there's, I was doing that a lot that night, and then I just I had a lapse in judgment just because it's like I really want to have a chance against that car, uh, and I I most of the time like if I just if I saw myself going, you know. If I saw that rear end start to come around, or I was going left or going right, like look, like I was gonna hit something. Like basically, if I got anywhere close to disqualifying myself, I just aborted, because it's like I, I'm either gonna jack up my car or I'm gonna jack up someone else's. So, yeah. I mean, we're not, it's not like we're racing, so it's like there's there's not even a reason for me to stay in it at that point. Nothing's on the line. Sure, so, exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you know when things can open up again and we can actually hold events, then we'll we'll get started. Nice. But right now we're just learning. So, Tyler started out with the, and actually this will end up being a good segue for body stuff, but um, Tyler started out with the C10 that Adam has. Correct. And his car was pretty darn good. Yeah, it, that was already a good car with a good body on it, yeah. And so it, it's obviously, like, even better than is what you're saying now That with the, with the S10. That S10, to me, at this point... Um, without going just a straight up pro mod body and something else kind of feels like the bit of a benchmark right now. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's just like driving a wedge really. I mean, it's just so flat and so wide, you know, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of weird air gaps and things like that. So, I mean, like the, yeah, the, the, the C10 body was already really good on it. That was the first, the per, first pass I ever did on a drag car was with his, um, SC six based with that body. And it was awesome. Uh, nice. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bodies that are working out there right now. It's just a matter of like, it, we're at this point we're we're looking for very small amounts of of speed. Did you have any kiting issues with your uh, C10, Adam, or did it stay pretty well planted? Uh, for the most part, it stayed pretty well planted. My only issue I had was, and it was just bad advice. So after talking with Tyler Zavadil, he said turn your um, basically turn your endpoints down on your servo so that way like going that fast you don't need super crazy response because he said if you're starting to get a little out of hand if you crank it all the way like left or right it's gonna straighten out easier than if it's super sensitive because when it's super sensitive and you're going that fast one little turn is gonna just send you either into the rail or over the line so he said you want to turn it down well I did that and um, the first time I was making a couple passes trying to get the, um, I guess the, the gearing right before I completely went to a new motor and haven't driven it since, but um, was playing around with that and 
basically, I w it was working fine for me. Well, I let Elio drive it, and he's like, dude, what's wrong with your steering? And I'm like, I turned it all the way down because, you know, I, it was a recommendation. And he goes, no, you need to turn it back up. Well, when it came down to racing and when the thing was on the line, well, of course, what happened happened. I pinned it, and it launched pretty good, but then started to go towards the rail, so I tried to correct and just shot completely over, missed the other guy's car by like an inch and just smacked into the other curb. So yeah, as far as uh, kiting, no issues. Um, as far as uh, setting up the car, should have just stuck with my gut. Yeah. So. Well, sounds like you had pretty good luck then though. Yeah, for the most part. The only, only thing I did was I put two little holes because that was a recommendation from um, Chris Patterson. Um, he used to be on the MKS team. Uh, he reached out to me when I was talking about going down to do a, um, an event down at JJ Customs, and he said, oh, I just got one recommendation since you haven't done this before. He goes, bodies like that seem to pick up a lot of air. He goes, you need some like speed holes in it to let the air out so it doesn't you know, get uh, you know, airborne. Right. So. Which that's... I don't know. You never race short course, but that's actually like that's a pretty typical thing. So it's not you know anything bad. Yeah, no, I never really race short course. Um, now after actually playing around with um, with the drag racing, like with the basically it's the same car as my short course truck. Um, I have a slash four wheel drive, and I also have the slash two wheel drive that got turned into the drag car. Um, maybe I'll turn down the steering just a smidge on my four-wheel drive, and maybe it won't, like, I don't know. The four-wheel drive doesn't seem to spin out as much because the front's pulling. It's just the two-wheel drive, the little sensitivity in the steering. It just wants to go left or right. Sure. So, but, yeah. Not bad. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, I... I do like that they're starting to go with some of the narrower ones. Like, what is that new one that J Concepts has? Is that a Grand National? I think so. I that thing good. looks that looks pretty good too. Like, actually, really good. I think. I don't know. I think what's going to happen is I'm going to end up having to get like a DR10 or something because I think Trav and I's tastes and. Like, our preferences are just kind of different. Like, I need a car that's way dumbed down so I don't do anything stupid, whereas you drive a little more precisely. So. 1987 Buick Grand National. Pretty sweet looking. I, the narrower looks way better, huh? Mm-hmm. After looking at that Octane body, like, I'm not even sure you need to run the shorter buggy arms with it. Like, I, it it's so wide i'll be curious to see what the nova's like i'm sure it's probably the same thing but i don't know i am kind of excited to see what trav thinks once that thing gets here interesting they also came out with the 70s uh chevy c10 slash k10 body not the one that you have a different one a different one the one i have uh well actually no i don't even have i don't even have one of these bodies anymore um so I, I used to have a Proline one of the 72. This is a 70 C10 from J Concepts, so i um, not sure if it's wider because back when I had the Proline one, it was kind of a skinny body. Huh, really? Mm hmm Yeah, no, the C10 body I have, that's like a 50. Is that different? Oh, I'm talking about okay. that was one that was sitting on a – trail truck i was just saying like it was interesting i haven't been on here in a while to look so i was just saying oh interesting they have this oh gotcha Ooh, ooh! i don't know if i can make that work ooh. though Ooh, they have a 2005 chevy 1500 monster truck single cab i'm gonna have to look at the specs on that is the monster truck one gonna work well that's what i'm saying i'm gonna have to look at the monster i might have to look at the i might not so it's, it's it's a seven and a quarter. It, it sounds like you don't know what you want to do. Well, no, I know what I want to do. <laughs> I have a body that can do it. Yeah. So basically, there is a guy on Instagram that I follow um, who's got a truck. I guess the Instagram account is Baby Duramax, I think is what he calls it. Or Baby LML, something like that. Anyways, 
it's a single cab Duramax that's like a super it's like a street truck. He takes it out to the to the track, throws slicks on it, you know, all that stuff. Ton of money dumped into it. I thought it'd be cool to do that with my drag car. Put a single cab, you know, body that could you could say is a diesel, put a little stack in the back and race with it. That would be pretty rad. So that would actually be really rad. So yeah, so I was looking around. I think the closest was Probably have to go back to it. Uh, go to Proline. Yeah, because yeah, I think they have one. It's I forget what they call it, but when you click on the Chevy in the short course, they call it something. It's just the well, that's twenty nineteen. Where is it? Oh, there it is. They got the Chevy Silverado Pro Touring clear body. So I thought about getting that because that's, you know, more of like street-ish and then just put a stack in the back of it. That would be pretty rad. And it's designed for the Slash um, or the 22 SCT. So, but yeah. I hope I hope we get enough bodies where it's like crawling to where there's – Lots and lots and lots of choices to choose from. Oh. And I hope they keep staying this thinner design and we get some awesome ones to choose from. You mean so it doesn't end up like where everybody shows up with the Black Nova? Yeah, like a Camaro would be cool, either new or old. Um, some Dodges would be really cool, like some Chargers and Challengers and stuff would be pretty neat. I guess the DR10 body is kind of somewhat... Um, Plymouth Duster looking, which is pretty cool too. It's it's a lot skinnier too. I noticed in the Proline bodies and stuff that the stock DR10 body is really really close to the edge of the wheels, which was it. It actually looks really good. Well, um, as far as the well, it's under short course, but as far as like some of these drag bodies go from J Concepts, they do have the '67 Chevy Camaro. Huh. Mm -hmm. They have a sixty. They have one. a sixty-seven Chevy Chevelle. They got a ninety-one Ford Mustang. You could paint it all white and call it Vanilla Ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you could. You could be rolling in your five point mm -hmm. They have. Well, those are actually much. Those are actually like short course bodies. Where is another drag one? They got the seventy-two C ten. That one's kind of cool. That's a drag body. And I think they also have the Lightning, and I think that's the last, like, yeah, Ford F-150 Lightning. I saw it. There was a couple guys. Well, no, maybe there was just two. I'm trying to remember now, but one of the guys at the track had one of those. And then I haven't seen the S10 in person yet. I've seen, I think, all the Novas, and I've seen the Super J in person, too. Like, there's one guy there that has a Super J body, and that th that car actually works really, really well. It was surprising. Yeah, like, but like you said, I mean, they're starting, they are starting to gain popularity, so we're starting to see more bodies, so. They're listening. The belted tires is going to be kind of interesting to see too, because the last I heard, Tim said he really liked the uh, regular Hoosiers better than the belted version. So I'll be curious to see what Trav thinks about. Yeah, do we still have, we still have rain this weekend? Is that what it's looking um, like? I mean, I got to look again because it was supposed to not rain yesterday and it did. So thoughtful. Uh, yeah, actually, it's probably, yeah, it's, it's supposed to rain. Hmm. So, gives me time to get that car fixed, I guess. Yeah, well, I was going to say, parts will be here Friday, so. Sick. Yeah, so that'll be cool. Well, um, we should get into some, we don't have any questions this week, do we? Because we didn't post anything, did we? Correct. Man, just. I don't know. I've just felt like really distracted this week for some reason. It's been weird. Kind of stuck up on me. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like it's just time. I don't know why, but you know, for being like under quarantine and stuff like that, and on lockdown, like 
time is passing surprisingly fast. Like it, it's kind of blown me away. It's really weird. Yeah, it's June already, man. I know it's nuts. It's crazy. I just, I'm just chomping at the bit to get out and do some stuff. It'll be kind of nice. Yeah, I want to go fast. So, I learned something this week, and I don't, you know, I don't know if it, it's weird. Like, when you start looking at bodies and stuff, what you would think would be fairly popular sometimes isn't. So, the IFS Tacoma build that I've been working on with all the Night Customs 3D printed parts and stuff like that, that thing has gotten a surprising amount of people asking what body that is which i was really shocked by um one dude mistook it for a tundra which easy mistake um but most people just had no idea what it was some thought it was the rc four-wheel drive body but it's quite a bit smaller and it's a uh, crew cab whereas this one's just an extended cab but uh it was weird i just i figured that would have been something that was on people's radar and it just wasn't um i don't know it must be kind of a similar situation to like the service bed that we had helped with uh with on pro line you know like we thought it was a lot more popular than it was and next thing you know it ended up being discontinued so i kind of hope that i don't know i the way some stuff gets discontinued like i get like a little bit of anxiety and sometimes almost feel like i need like a spare of bodies that i really like to just kind of hoard away so that i have them later on you know so you're not like the broncos one of them you know it's like I know that body's been around for a while now from Proline, but I'd really like to kind of have an extra just in case, you know, to like one for driving, one for looking pretty. So I don't know. Nice. Is anybody making their own bodies at this point, like recreationally? Oh, yeah. Lots of guys are 3D printing them. As far as, yeah. You're vacuum forming them. Yeah, that I haven't seen. Um, Todd has, uh, but he kind of abandoned that for um, 3D printing, though, didn't he? Okay, so the reason why he abandoned it is the amount of money that it costs. So from my understanding, what he, the issues he had was, like, for instance, um, somebody was like, oh, I want this body 3D printed. And he's like, all right, cool, I can do that, but I have to make a puck. So he basically would buy resin, or no, first he would do, how would he do that? I, I forget, you almost have to ask him. He basically would have to mold the body that you want to do, like make a shell, then he'd have to pour it full of that resin, let it harden, but he said the trickiest part is getting the body to stay like, you know, like once you make that mold, when you pour it full of resin, the resin's heavy, it wants to blow the sides out, so you almost had to build like, a box or a cradle to hold that body from like you know molding out and then he could have a puck and then that's how he kind of like did then from there on it was all just you know setting it there heating up his uh, Lexan and just pulling it over the puck let it cool down and pull it off um, he just said it was a lot of money and some people at the time like we're for it they were like oh, i don't care what it costs you know and then others are like yeah no not going to pay that kind of money for you to copy this body well so i read somewhere that somebody or i didn't read it but i saw a youtube video and it was a guy he was the example he used was a kyosho um rb6 two-wheel drive race buggy body and he filled it with plaster of paris and had really good luck but that's a small body it is fairly rigid because it is so small and there's no really long you know sides or surfaces where it could kind of like spill out you know when it's full of stuff but i wonder i mean i'm sure todd's a smart guy i'm sure he probably already thought of this but i i'm kind of curious as to why he went like a resin route instead of going with like plaster of paris like this guy did in the video yeah, I forget why because I think he was worried – was it he worried about heat? There was a reason why he went a certain way. I don't know. It's – like I said, everybody's got their method to their own madness. Um, but yeah, he still does like the 3D printing – or 3D printing. He still does the vacuum forming for little things like I know when he did my um, 
the work on that avalanche body, turning it into a extended cab Chevy body, he was able to take the black glass that came from the actual RC or the new bright body or whatever it was, and he actually was able to vacuum form over that. And because it was Lexan, he made a couple of relief cuts in the corners, and it pops right in, and it's clear. So then you can actually have a clear glass versus you know the all black. So right. um, that worked out fine. He does a lot of smaller parts because when he started getting into the bodies, that was the other issue he had. He had to make his vacuum table bigger, and he had to make the vacuum more powerful because the way he had it set up originally wasn't strong enough to pull the plastic around the um, the bigger objects. Gotcha. That makes sense. So, and he did all his stuff. I mean, I do got to I do got to give him credit where credits due. He came up with a really trick way to get all of his stuff for the vacuum to work so well. Yeah. So, well, he got a couple of different air tanks and set them up in a certain way. So when he, oh wow, yeah. So when he opens up the one valve, it would just, and that was it. No kidding. So he's not even using a shop vac or anything because this guy had like a little. So he made a table out of MDF, and then the part that you set the puck on is made out of pegboard. And so you would just set the peg, you know, set the puck on top of the pegboard, and then he had a frame that sandwiched a piece of Lexan in. He would put that in the oven, pull it out, and then he would set it over the top of the box. So basically, it was like a picture frame type lid, you know, but it was sandwiching Lexan that covered the top of it. He would put that down and kick on his shop vac, and his table was only. I don't know, you know, probably maybe four to six inches deep, like inside, you know, the hollow cavity that was in there. And he had sealed it up with, sealed it up with silicone and everything. And then he had put, he just ran the hose through a hole right into the side of it for his shop back and turned that on. And uh, he would heat the Lexan to the point of where it was starting to sag in the center in the um, oven. And then he would set it on and then, you know, hit his button and then it would like suck it all down. And I think he had... For that framework that held the Lexan, I think he had some of that like um, sticky backed uh, foam camper shell gasket that you can get at like Home Depot or RV stores and stuff. And so that's kind of what, you know, helped create the suction. So he had like that foam gasket and he set it down, hit the switch and it just sucked it all in. But like I said, it was relatively small. You know, I mean, we're talking like maybe a 10 inch long two wheel drive buggy body that he was doing. And I think Wes, Wes has a, um, Wes Braswell, we got to get him on here sometime soon too. Keep forgetting about that. We're sorry, Wes, but he has one. And I want to say all the pucks that he makes, those are what MDF and Bondo for the most part. Doesn't he kind of like carve and shape everything or model it out of clay or something first? Yeah, if I believe, yeah, I believe so. Cause I mean, he's, he's got some really cool methods. Cause like, I remember I originally hit him up for like a early 2000s Chevy S10 after I saw something in a magazine. I said, oh, this would be kind of cool if I mimic this. Like, what do you think about that? And he's like, oh, well, he goes, being that it is, you know, what it is, I'd make like 95% of the body out of um, styrene. He goes, this part, this part, and this part, I'd have to vacuum form the styrene to get all those contours. And um, I was like, Wow. So I was like, that's some, like, crazy stuff. He goes, oh, yeah, I just would have to model this. And, I mean, like, he's got a talent. Like, he's got some true talent. Oh, I believe it, yeah. All of that. I mean, that stuff's so hard. And, like, I can't imagine, like, trying to keep everything symmetrical, too. Like, that would be really tough. Oh, yeah, I know how that is. Because even, like, when it comes to just, like, fabricating stuff, it gets hard making it, you know, symmetrical. Like, you're building a something like a cage or even a bumper or something and you're trying to keep like both ends looking the same, it's yeah, it gets a little tough sometimes. Um, and I, it goes the same way with even bodies, like doing body modifications. I remember the very first body that I ever did any modification to was the Tamiya Claude Buster body. Uh, I closed in where the blower would come through the hood. Uh, I got rid of the sunroof. I, uh, pinched the front and dovetailed the rear and yeah okay so good question here for people that so 
I, I think we all can agree that there's like kind of a weird, huge following of, well, not, not huge, but like, there's definitely like this, like group of people that prefer hard bodies. And you always see them commenting on stuff like when's Axial going to come out with a hard body, when's Vanquish going to come out with a hard body and stuff like that. And the reason that they don't is injection molding is super, super expensive. Um, like ridiculously expensive, but also, I mean, it's not everybody's preferred go-to as far as, you know, I mean, everybody thinks that the thing that they like is way more, more popular than it really is just because they're personally, you know, like really, really excited about it. And so you've got this group of hard body guys that are just pretty diehard in the fact that like, they really dislike Lexan and hard bodies, the only way to go and stuff like that. So if somebody is wanting to start doing some hard body mods and stuff, when you were doing things like pinching the nose and dovetailing or bobbing the bed, those are usually, I see at least some of the very first questions people have is I want to do this. How do you do it? So when you've done that stuff, like what are some of the tools that you use? Like, do you, I know exacto has like a, uh, it, it's it's hard to explain. It's like a razor blade, but it also has like saw teeth, and I guess it's for cutting really finely. Do you use one of those for like cutting out the hood? You know, when you're going to segment stuff, or what do you what are you doing to make those modifications tool wise? Well, people are probably going to cringe when I say this, but I use a Dremel. And you're able to get it straight like that? Uh, you just got to know how to use the Dremel and have it on the right setting. Dude, I so I usually try and clean up my wheel wells and just little areas with a Dremel, but man, I am so unsteady with that thing. It's crazy. I can't imagine trying to do that with a Dremel. Well, like I said, it's all about how you hold it. Um, like I've had it. Like my trick is, it's almost like I put it on a speed where I know it's gonna basically cut through the material, and I kind of use my hand or my fingers as a guide. So like I'll hold it in a way where I can like set rest my hands a certain way on the body and just like that. So that's like my feeler gauge, I guess is the best way to say it. Like you can like rest, like if I'm holding it, I can rest my, like I'm trying to think about it right now. So if I'm holding it right now, my right, I'm right-handed, so that's obviously the more control hand. My left hand is almost like cradling the right, and I can use my knuckles as like a guide and kind of like follow the body and that's when oh I, you're using it like a fence almost yes gotcha that's actually a really good idea so do you when you're making these cuts and stuff i mean you're using like what masking tape and stuff like masking tape yeah out. masking tape you draw your line and all that stuff and yeah i mean and then the best part is, or the easiest part is follow those lines like the like as long as you're following your lines when you put everything back together it it works really well um the other the other tool that I've seen people use is uh, some people have used a hot knife successfully. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever messed with one of those, um, but no. Uh -uh. So a hot knife basically is I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. It's almost like a soldering iron. Like you almost have two soldering iron tips with a well. I guess there's two configurations. This was a hot knife wire style. Um, but then they actually make one called a hot knife, where it's basically like I said, a soldering iron, and it heats up you know, a blade and you can pull it through the plastic and it just cuts like a hot knife through butter. Um, the, the one that I'm talking about is, uh, it's got like two points and you string a wire through it, almost like a bow and you can change the tension. So like you could make it really tight and narrow or you can loosen it up obviously when it's not on, otherwise you'll burn yourself. And, then you could use that and almost pull that through and that, you know, the heat is basically what's heating up the plastic and then the wires pulling through. The the one that I'm talking about, that one is not as precise because the wire can flex, so you're not going to get, you know, the perfect cut, but an actual hot knife will give you a better, closer cut. I know somebody like Wes will probably tell me, no, don't use that because they're, the one drawback is when you're cutting with stuff like that, even with the Dremel, when you're cutting through plastic, it creates that like melted, you know, residue cut off material, kind of like right out, kind of like rolls up on the edges yes. a little bit. So when, for sure. when you're done, you got to come back and you got to kind of like break it off. So um, yeah, there's that issue. But um, 
other than that, that's what I've used. Otherwise, a lot of other people will just use a really nice, um, you know, Exacto knife, uh, and or what you're talking about, the Exacto brand. I call it just like a mini saw. It's exactly what you described. It's got a bunch of little teeth. It's like four or five inches long, and you can just cut with that. Um, the other thing I've had some success with, depending on what you're cutting, like for instance, if I'm cutting um, flat pieces, I've had decent luck using a bandsaw. Really? Yeah, use like one, like, well, maybe I'm just lucky. My dad has one with a really fine blade on it, so you can actually get really, it's almost like a scroll saw. You can actually get really tight terms, so you can actually mark what you want. And what I learned was cut just a little bit proud of what you want and then come back and use like a Dremel with like the mini drum on it and just clean up and get you a lot closer to that line where you want and then it's a lot of just fitting, testing, fitting, testing and then make sure everything's where you want it. So when you when you're using your Dremel, do you have a sanding drum on it? Is that what you're using like the small like quarter inch one or whatever? Yes, when I'm clean is? when I'm cleaning up some stuff, when I'm cutting, I use the cutoff wheel. Do you ever use like a sanding block to like get the line straight or anything because i know like the little bit of stuff that i do with lexan i i like using a sanding block because it just seems like you can get a nice long smoother edge that way yeah when you're doing like a long sand yeah i've used that um the other thing too is like like i said it was my first attempt and i was just kind of trying to see where it would go like i wasn't going for like super like you know beauty points and making this thing like super perfect um i kind of told myself you know Bondo is my friend, so if I didn't like if if the line wasn't perfect, I'd glue it shut for the most part. And if there was a little bit of a gap, I backed all my seams not only with um, what is that stuff called, plasti weld, I think is what it's called, or plasti struct or something, or I don't know. I could be mixing the name with the brand and all that stuff, but um, I almost want to say it was plasti weld, and um, it was a clear it's a clear liquid and at least the bottle I had had an orange label on it um, but that stuff works really well it basically like starts to melt the plastic together I wouldn't rely on just that like yes it does make a pretty strong bond but I like to back my um, my mating surfaces so like for instance like in the corner I would just take a thin strip of styrene kind of dab that stuff on it and put it on kind of bridging the two that way it gives you a little more, um, I guess, strength. And then it, like, when you're looking down at your line, if it was only touching a little bit here and maybe it got away from you in certain areas, I didn't really care because I just kind of like smeared some Bondo in there and then sanded it, made it a little smooth, and just called it a day. Huh, no kidding. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the guy. I'm not the best guy to talk body work with. No, but you've had a lot more experience than I have with hard body stuff. Like, I've had one hard body rig, and it was a uh, Boom Racing D90 that I had put together. And it just, I don't know, I mean, it was super detailed, but the weight was a huge turnoff for me, especially on something like that, because I just went, you know, like, full dollhouse on it with, like, metal roof racks and stuff like that. But I've never had any experience messing around with you know cutting on it and re-gluing things and stuff like that i mean i'd imagine you know it's pretty easy now lexan well not easy but fairly easy because you can use a lot of you've got bondo you've got body filler and all you know spot putty and all these different things that you can use on the abs plastic versus with lexan and i'm i'm kicking myself for not writing this down i really do need to have a notepad that i just keep notes on and just leave it on my desk but um, Matt from May Main was telling me about the stuff that they carry that actually almost, it's a two-part epoxy, but you can use it on Lexan so that you can actually like do some body filler work and stuff like that on Lexan bodies. And I think the first thing that I ever like really started cutting up, um, I think last week we talked about the Proline body that I had made like the soft top ha uh, fast back for that was like the first time I ever messed with Lexan and I had tried just scoring it very lightly and busting the top off 
that that worked really well. You know, if you score it and then kind of, you know, bend it a little bit to pop the lines. Um, I don't have the steadiest hand, so it did use some blocks. I did have to block sand some of those flat edges, but way, way back in 2016, um, we had done a JK RK, which at the time there wasn't a JLU and Casey Curry had a pre-runner that was a IFS front end Jeep extra cab pickup conversion. And I, it's different than the brute, right? Like the brute is a whole different animal altogether, isn't it? Well, see, this is where I got confused. So basically to me, the Brute is like the – I don't know. Would the Brute be the predecessor to the Gladiator? Maybe. See, I never saw it. Like he called – Casey called it a JK-8, yeah, see, that, which I had never heard yes. of. Yes. So see, I've heard of a JK-8. I've heard of a Brute. And then obviously now we have the Gladiator. Well, to me, I think the Brute – in the JK8, I almost want to say are the same thing. I might have to look it up, but the difference was, and I guess that's where you can say it's not the same as the Gladiator, is the Gladiator is a four-door, whereas the Brute slash JK8 was a two-door with like almost like an extended cab. You just had a little bit behind the seat, and then it was a bit. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's it was something like – so. I don't know if you ever saw this four-door one, but we went down to, um, God, I think it was Florence, Oregon, and met him to pick up some tires one day. And uh, so we, my buddy Jared and I buzzed down there for the day to pick up the tires and come back. And he had his um, big, like, support rig there, the black, like, I don't know if it's an international or what. I'd have to look at it again. But it looks kind of like a Dakar rally support truck in a way you know it's just black with like curry and monster and magpul and stuff on it he had that with a really big flatbed trailer he had his crew cab and i don't even know what the hell you would call this thing but it was like a jk it was a jku but it was a crew cab with a truck bed and god he told me that thing was like 180 grand to build like just ridiculous you know and i mean that's like I mean, he obviously has a lot of rad stuff at his disposal to build something like that. But anyways, so I I don't know what that one was called. But basically, to kind of circle back to where I was going with this, the JKRK was like, as soon as he started posting pictures of it, everybody was going crazy over that thing. So I decided I was going to try and make one. And so I took um, an Axial, JK the 2012 JKU, And then the hard top for it in the cage. So basically I bought like the whole body set minus the hard top, which I think is like 85 bucks or something. I mean, it was fairly expensive, but it came with like everything that you needed, you know, like the fender flares, taillights, all that stuff, steering wheel. And so I had taken that thing. I cut out the raised portion in the bed that axial gives you stickers for the um a fuel cell or you can make it like a storage trunk you know on the decal sheet so i had to cut that part out to get rid of that hump in there and then i cut the cage i mounted the cage on the body cut it to where i wanted the cab to end and then took and had to section the hard top to so i cut it right behind the driver's windows on the sides and then cut across the roof and then i cut the back where you had the very very rear windows at the a b c so it would have been the d pillar so where the rear window meets the d pillar the very back of it i kind of gauged like how much extra cab window i was going to use i'll post some pictures when we post up this episode but i cut down there put them together and with Lexan, I, I aside from the stuff Matt was talking about, I don't really know a whole lot of products that you can use for working with Lexan if you're wanting to like mate different surfaces, surfaces and stuff. And so um, 
I tried some Lexan glue and stuff and it fogged a little bit and I wasn't super happy with it. But one of the things we did with racing with short course bodies, cause they get so torn up is we would use that yellow plastic, um, kind of drywall mesh tape. And we would layer that with shoe goo and that fiber, uh, that, uh, drywall tape and layer it like you do fiberglass. And that's how we would hold all the Lexan together from the inside. And then the the problem is, is if you looked in the windows and looked up at the roof and stuff, you know, you would see, you know, I painted it black so it wasn't as noticeable. But, you know, I tried to kind of hide some of it. But what I didn't like about it is you still had that line where the surfaces meet. And it was frustrating not having some sort of body filler that you can use. And so I get everything cut, put back on, put the newly you know shrunken down and sectioned hard top for the jeep on it and then at the time i was using a really thick laminate it wasn't always super easy to work with because it was dirt bike graphics laminate so it was like 12 mil like really thick stuff but i used that to wrap it and the wrap did a pretty decent job with hiding all of the seams and stuff on it like for a lexan body it wasn't bad like it was I wouldn't recommend doing it and not wrapping it because it's all going to be super visible. Um, now, you know, you've got like all these like China made JK looking hard bodies that would be that are ABS. It would be much easier to do a build like what I had done. But, uh, you know, it, it worked pretty well. It was pretty durable and everything. Um, I so you have an extra set of door hinges for the rear doors on it. And when you're doing the truck conversion, that part's the extra cab. So what I did is I cut out the hinges with, you know, I just scored it and popped them out with an X-Acto knife. And then I shoegooed some Lexan to the back side of it. So now you've kind of closed the hole up from the back, but, you know, you still have a hole in the surface area, even though it's backed with Lexan now. So then I took and filled that with Shugu and then used um, one of those little tiny squeegees that you use for using like a caulking on tubs and sinks, you know, that like weird little plastic tool. Mm -hmm. I used one of those to smooth out the holes where the hinges was, and that ended up working really, really well. But I mean, I don't know. It, it's a lot of work. Either way, if you're doing Lexan or a hard body, but like with Lexan, especially now with all the neat 3D printed stuff that you can get, especially like for that Proline metric, you know, the unlicensed Tacoma body, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff you can get to where, I mean, it you really can get almost hard body level of detail now, aside from opening doors and stuff. You can get that kind of detail with Lexan bodies now. So I still don't quite understand the big rage over having you know hard bodies and stuff i know it, it's worth skill points for the sorka crowd for skill comps but i don't know i mean for the average dude that would be like my absolute last choice going with a hard body one just because the consequences are so severe if you hurt the thing but you can repair it so well, real quickly before I, I I looked up while you were talking, um, the differences between a brute and a JK8, and if anybody wants to hear it, I'll announce it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think what it is is I think they wanted to just be able to have that one vehicle offered by like Axial, or I'm sure one day maybe like, um, Enduro or um drawing a blank, Red Cat, uh, just to say they have something else other than like, you know, RC4 Wheel Drive is really the only company that comes out with an RTR um, or kit style vehicle that has a hard body on it. Uh, the price is significantly steeper for obvious reasons, but, you know, I guess, you know, if, the thing is, it, it might not be a, a top seller, but it could be like a cool in its own bracket kind of, you know, rig. So, right. you know, like, because, yeah, it'll probably sell. Some people will buy it, and obviously you got the diehards that'll buy it, uh, depending on what, you know, no matter what company does it. Um, but, yeah, um, I can agree with what you say about, like, you know, 3D printing definitely taking off now. Um, it's getting a lot easier to kind of come up with bodies that you want um, because, if you can render it in a 3D software and successfully print it out, then you have yourself a body that, you know, was kind of like deemed 
unavailable up until the birth of the 3D printer. Right, which I I mean I see a lot of 3D printed hard bodies now and that's a super attractive option if somebody I mean cuz basically like Todd's proven you can build any truck you want now with mm -hmm. a 3D printer. But what gets me is and this would probably maybe you know or this would be a good question for Todd, but how do you do like the I mean, the windows are one thing, like that's not super difficult. Like some windshields when they have like, you know, they're kind of, um, convexed, you know, that's, that's kind of hard obviously to like glue a piece of lex sand in and get that curve of the glass, like it would have in real life. But like, what, what are they doing for the headlight lenses and stuff like that? Well, nowadays, um, I know Todd, that's part of the reason why he has his resin printer is the resin prints so much finer. Then I forget what he calls the standard printer. The Travis will probably know. What FDM. FDM. Yeah, FDM. So the FDM, I guess, doesn't like you can print quote unquote clear, but it's not going to be the same as if you print clear resin. Like, for instance, and I don't know if it would show up on camera. Uh, Todd was messing around with his resin printer when he first got it, and he. Uh, he printed out one of these little crates and then he ended up painting it but when you look at it from the bottom you can see how clear it is and it's almost like it's almost like staring at like it, if you were staring at like a liquid in a container that like dried is the best way to say it cuz it's like whoa that's like super clean and super crystal clear like there's the lines are like almost like not even there it's that clear Wow, really? Because I guess the way the resin works, to my knowledge, is it's a chemical reaction with something else. I forget. Because basically you buy the resin, you pour it into the thing, and it does something. Todd kind of explained it to me, but I probably have to look that up too and give you a better explanation on what exactly a resin printer does. But it doesn't. it's not like a roll of filament heating up cooling down it's like a reaction with like inside the vat of uh, it's more of like a like solution substance so instead of instead of feeding a roll of, of plastic through an extruder you pour this solution into a tank mm -hmm. and then it, it kind of it, it prints it prints from above but not not like an FDM where like you print on a print bed where it's like it slowly extracts itself out of the top of the printer. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely different. Um, I see. Yeah, and then you also, there's a little more, I guess, uh, there's one more step. You're supposed to clean it and do something with it. Like basically, he calls it washing it and something else. You basically have to wash it and kind of cure it. Like there's a thing for it to do that. So he actually bought some machine that does it all for him now. Um, that's, I guess, one perk of being somebody who geeks out and really wants, like, to learn all the ins and outs. He, uh, got whatever it is that machine, whatever it does, and he pours the solution into it, and it kind of cleans it up, and then does whatever, but, yeah, um, that, that's one area that's starting to really, like, improve, is you can get something like that, and you have, you know, headlights and taillights, um, the, uh, I guess the other option is some people have made them, like they have, they've found Lexan that'll work or, um, you know, I guess that, that's really about it. I think, I want to say that Westmade has, in a way, vacuum formed some Lexan to pop in, if I'm not mistaken. I think I've seen them do that before, but I could be wrong. Um... But yeah, that's really about it. And then as far as windshields, that's always like a – that's like really one hindering. It's it's interesting to see all these people coming out with these 3D printed bodies, but then when it comes down to the windshield, it's like a vehicle that has no glass in it, period. There's no back window. There's no side window. There's no front window, and it's like – Yeah, like they kind of just stop there, huh? Well, because they have, nobody's really come up with a solid solution. Now – Right. There is different thicknesses of Lexan, so you could actually get a really thin piece, and if you could glue it in and kind of hold it in place as the glue is setting up, you could, like on a windshield, if even if it's got a slight 
you know, convex to it, you could actually probably glue one side and then just work your way across, like keep putting a dab, put pressure on there until it sets up. I mean, obviously you'd have to use something close to like a, a super glue or crazy glue, so that way it kind of sets or like 30-second epoxy and kind of, you know, just keep tacking it in place until you get your bend. But, um, yeah, that's really the only thing I can think of is just using that. Like I said... Todd comes up with a way to um, vacuum form so that way it kind of just goes in the way it's supposed to. Right. But, um, yeah. If you wanted that quick, um, it's really going to be like, I'm not kidding, like a one to two minute explanation between the Brute and the JK8. Yeah, let's hear it because that that's something that I've always been curious about and, like, I haven't ever known, like, the correct terminology there. Okay, so... According to the internet, the Brute was the original Wrangler conversion pickup truck designed by AEV, American Expedition Vehicles. They are the first company that, um, I guess it was in 2004, they um, came up with the you know concept, hey, what if we turned a four-door JK into a truck. So this is, I guess this would be closer to the predecessor of the Gladiator because basically what you're doing was you were still keeping a four-door Jeep, but you were now converting the back end of it into a truck. So um, it wasn't like the JK8, which was the officially licensed Mopar conversion to turn a four-door JK into a two-door pickup truck. So that was an actual Mopar conversion kit then for the JK8? Correct. Wow, no kidding. You know, they've done some cool stuff like that too. Like, did you ever see the Ram Runner that was kind of like Mopar's answer to the Raptor? I, I don't think it ever really caught on, but it was pretty cool looking. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look that up. You got me like on Google now looking up everything. Dude, look up the Ram Runner. It is freaking cool. So Trav is doing a metric build also, but he uh, has kind of hit a small bump in the road as far as what he wants to do with it because they're honestly like that body. There's kind of like an overwhelming choice of different headlight buckets and grills and all kinds of things you can go with. And like you can take that body and do like a straight up like purpose built rock crawler looking setup like what I did with mine you can do it kind of an overland look so I keep bugging Trav trying to pick his brain and find out like what direction he's going to go with with this thing but it's it's a he's back to big, work. De big decision huh there's just a lot <laughs> yeah. just a lot I can do with it I mean it's also hey I mean honestly what screwed this up for me which is ultimately a good thing, but the trail runner just kind of <laughs> threw a huge loop in all of this because it's kind of, it sort of, to me, stole the thunder of what I was trying to accomplish. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know which way I'm going to go about it now. So, You settled on wheels and tires, though, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, those things, those things can be changed at any point anyways, so... You know, I might as well just make them work. Which you're going with the BFG all terrains, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. Have you decided if you're going to run fender flares or not, or are you thinking you might just wait and get a trail runner body and run that on your rig? Well, then that, that it depends ultimately on if I decide I'm going to do IFS or not. Then right. As much as I'd like to, it also might not be in my best interest to given what I actually use the truck for. So sure. it might be more beneficial to me to just have a base element and solid axle front and rear. Um, that is, I mean, that's what I would like to do ultimately. I mean, that would be, I think, the coolest thing. But Do that and then buy the trail runner. Well, yeah, but then I'm also thinking about how realistic it is for me to buy a trail runner at this point. I don't know how, how I'm going to make that work. So I'm just kind of letting everything fall on its own, and we'll just see what happens as we go on right right now though i just i there's so many different ways i could take it i mean as i get closer and i start making some decisions then i'll 
you know, then I'll start posting pictures and stuff like that and little hints here and there as far as I, what, what I got planned. But I'm, I'm trying to really think this one through. Because it's whatever, awesome, it, but it, there's a... The way to... Right. It, it's awesome, but at the same time, it's really hard because there's so many choices. Like, wheels, tires, and body is, like, the biggest decision that you can make for a build. And there's so much to choose from, which is rad, but you can also think yourself into going in circles, kind of like, you know, what's happened with you now, because you've had, like, kind of a direction you wanted to go, and then that's kind of changed a little bit, and it's just... I don't know. I mean, sometimes I kind of stress out about it because, like, I want everything to look really good because it's always a representation of the business, obviously, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, I take those decisions really seriously, and, like, I spend a lot of time thinking about that stuff. But usually, like, I'll settle on something, and from that point, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to go with it. But, I mean, especially for somebody who isn't sponsored by, like, let's say a ProLine or RC four-wheel drive they their choices aren't limited by what that manufacturer produces and so i mean my god i mean where do you even start there's so much you could do which is really cool because i mean not too many years ago you didn't have half the choices we have today i mean for me to be honest with you the wheels and tires is not really even the problem like it's i that is a minor detail to me I know for a lot of people, like that's sort of the basis of a build, and that's that's what they do is pretty dependent on those choices. But for me, it's kind of the other way around. Like to me, those are sort of I, I just want them to complement the body. I don't really right. care though. I mean, because realistically, for someone like me, like I'm gonna eventually. I mean, I'm gonna be changing these things, so mm -hmm. I'm not gonna make the wheels and tires the basis of my build, I'm just going to have wheels and tires that work for what I'm trying to accomplish through the body. And you know, to me, like that's more important. And that's where I'm having trouble at this point, deciding a route forward. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like I said, it's just something I have to take my time on at the moment. Well, you, you picked a really good choice though. So, I mean, you have the metric body, which like we said before is a, uh, unlicensed version of a Toyota Tacoma. So you've got that. The you, you chose SSD contender wheels. I think that's what they are. They're the ones that look like the TRD wheel. Yeah, yeah. And then BFG all terrains, which those the Proline BFG all terrains look good on almost anything. Like they're kind of in my opinion, if you're doing a scale build, they're kind of like the perfect size tire because they can work on something that you're going with a little bit, you know, oversized look. If you have a smaller body, if you have a bigger body, it'll look, you know, more like, you know, as 33s or 35s on something, you know. So, I mean, those tires are, it's kind of hard to lose when you choose those tires. I wouldn't be surprised if this turned out to be more of an overland style build just because I feel like I, I can do that. So why shouldn't I? The only thing it's going to do is it's going to hold back some of its climbing ability. Yeah, but, if I'm, but at this point, if I'm scaling it out, then that means that I'm going to have to throw an IFS on it anyways. And so at this, like, which I'm not saying it's going to detract for that, but I'm just saying that at that point, it's very clear the intent of what the truck is supposed to be. If I do that, then I will have to work in another builder's kit down the line, and then I will make just the the, the line killer. So, right. I mean, like I said, I, I, it, for me, for me, it's a it's a one or the other. I can't really have both at this point. I think that that's what I've kind of decided on. Sure. So that's where I'm at. Really curious to see how this thing comes together. I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, me too. Realistically, I, I honestly just need to start sketching some stuff out and figuring out how if I can get what I think looks cool in my head on paper and then onto the vehicle itself. Then I think that I mean, like you know, I, I I can do the the night customs thing to it and make it a really night customs heavy rig. That, that is fairly likely. There's also a lot of things I would like to do it on my own. So that's going to be, it's going to also be halfway a bit of an experiment as well. So for 
people that don't follow my personal page, um, Trav and I got a 3D printer for work for me to have here so he can send files over to me and I can print and test fit, you know, when we're prototyping parts and stuff. But one of the nice things about this, though, is that now, you know, once I get this set up, I can print like your engine and your, you know, all the, the grill headlight buckets. I can print all of this stuff here for you since I usually take care of wrapping the body and doing all that once you, you know, pick a design that you're going to go with. So that'll be kind of cool, you know, like I can basically get all of that ready here at this location and then just meet up with you and give it to you when it's all done. Yeah, that's true too. So that'll be kind of cool. I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous trying to get my feet wet in the 3D printing world i hope it ends up being pretty user friendly so oh it's hell, oh, it's hell. but it's cool <laughs> thanks i mean it's just, <laughs> it, it can be really cool it's just it's you got to give it the uh the attention it deserves oh yeah no i hear you no i think that's gonna be awesome though i'm really looking forward to that yeah me too i'm excited that's that's gonna be an interesting build for you yeah Hey, <laughs> you know what's funny is it said it was partly assembled and i look at it and it's like i'm seeing right away that their definition and mine are just radically different when it comes yeah. to partly assembled because there is a lot of pieces i was honestly hoping like maybe you know you put on the you know the two pillars you know for the motors and everything to move up and down on but um no. no, it's not that way. I mean, no. you know, there's only one reason I am particularly thankful that I built mine, and that is that I know how to fix it now. Yeah, you got like a working knowledge. That's the only reason. Otherwise, I mean, it was like I said, um, I've said this on a previous episode, but it was another $250 to pay for it fully assembled and just ready to go out of the box. And I would have done it. I didn't see that option for this one. They probably um, don't sell it that way. Really? Not like a universal thing. Well, what I didn't realize, and this is just pure ignorance on my part, but I didn't realize there's like groups on Facebook centered around 3D printing and stuff. Oh, which yeah. Is... There's a group for everything now, and those can be pretty – those can be pretty awesome sources of information and help. Um, they also can be really frustrating. Um well, yeah, you got third. It's like anything, like with the RC well, world, too, yeah. you got thirty different opinions on one thing. Well, not only that, but just like RC groups too, it also somehow becomes a customer support thread, is what people think it is. So you also got to keep that in mind. And sometimes the stuff that people post on there, I mean, much to their demise, but it can be pretty funny as well. So yeah, which, which I I get like. You know what's weird about this, and I mean, it does sound really stupid if you, I mean, obviously my whole scope of Facebook, like, basically I'm just there because of RC, like, I don't mm -hmm. really, you know, whatever, I don't really care about, you know, if it wasn't for RC, I would only be on Facebook for memes, and so that would, you know, stuff to laugh at, that's all I would use it for, but I didn't realize, you know, I mean... The, my whole scope of interest there is RC. I just didn't realize there's groups for this because when we were racing moto and stuff, I wasn't part of any Facebook groups for Supermoto or motocross or anything like that. I mean, well, that wasn't really a thing then, to be fair. Oh, oh, it wasn't back then. Not really, no. Because like what I quit in 2011, so. Yeah, maybe there just wasn't groups then. Maybe that was a new thing. Yeah, I mean, Facebook at that time was pretty primitive. You know, there really wasn't a whole lot to it. So that's I, true. I, dare I say it? I think groups actually came after that point. So, Do you remember when you had a limit to the number of photos you could upload? No, I don't remember that. It was really early on. I think MySpace was that way too. And then like the movie Three Hundred came out, and so they did this like cross promotion thing with. It was either MySpace or Facebook, but you were then allowed to have 300 photos, you know, because of 300 the movie. Oh, funny. And then that was kind of like that happened, and then next thing you know, like you can have unlimited numbers of photos now. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Stuff's weird. Very. Adam, what are you doing, Adam? What am I doing? What are you doing? I'm looking up your information for your Ram Runner. Oh. I'm old. I forgot that we were even talking about that. Sorry. <laughs> so ridiculous. So it must be a Mopar thing. 
Yeah, it was. No, no, no. Meaning Mopar. like, like, well, look at the Jeep. Jeep obviously is owned by Mopar. Uh, to do like these upgrade kits, like they weren't like they weren't. So it wasn't a production vehicle. It, right. It, it was like a factory option at the dealership or something, wasn't it? Correct. And it was actually, to my understanding, I don't know if you could, if you had to like from what I'm reading, I don't know if you if you could like roll back in with your truck after you bought it and say, yeah, I want to turn this thing into a pre-runner, let's uh, do it. Or if you had to, you know, buy it or order the car that way. Right. Like when you, I don't know, like when you get a car and like they, sometimes they have options where they can add leather interior Mm -hmm. to the model that you have sitting there on the lot and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly, but basically what it was, it was, yeah, it was just a, it was an upgrade kit. It was basically the grand total package with with the stage stage two suspension was a twenty thousand six hundred fifty nine plus installation fees, um, and that's usually they re- and they said they recommend that you. So it sounds like you can almost order the kit and have anybody install it, but they said they recommend your shop does the work. But it said uh, you can actually pick up the ram and then do the work later so yeah huh dude you know what trips me out about vehicles like that and the raptor is you always hear about like when somebody lifts a truck or they put different wheels and tires on about it voiding the factory warranty like it it i just can't wrap my mind around ford releasing a pickup that like in their promo pictures shows them like jumping it you know so like you're basically encouraged to like jump the shit out of it and have fun with it and still have a factory warranty somehow and then you know same with like chrysler and mopar with the ram runner like do you know twenty thousand dollars worth of modification to it and you know it's still covered if something goes wrong like it just it seems like they would be opening themselves up for such a massive loss of money you would think you know with something like that yeah i don't know because it's actually um from a youtube video i watched not too long ago um there's actually a new uh, i don't know if it's going to be like at every dealership or if you need to go on this website and then see what dealerships offer it but uh there's a guy i follow on youtube uh, last line of defense and he's a big time overlander like that's what he does he uh has a toyota Tacoma, I want to say it's like a fairly new one, like 2016 and newer. And uh, he's he's got you know uh, everything decked out, you know, rooftop camper, winches, lights, upgraded suspension, you know, the works. And he recently did a video within the last couple of weeks about how there are some dealers or there's a company. And I forget the name of the company, but they're working with the dealership, so you could actually like purchase. Like for instance, you could go buy. And it would only it obviously only works with the vehicles they have parts designed for, but you could go buy. Like let's say you wanted to get a Chevy uh, Colorado or a GMC Canyon, and you wanted it to be outfitted to go, you know, overlanding. You purchase the rig from that said dealership. They have a partnership with that company. They put all the stuff on it for you, and you still get a warranty, but it's a modified warranty because you're going to be taking it off-road. But because everything was done at the dealership, you have a warranty. And it's kind of like weird to see that stuff happen because it's kind of like what you just said. You're encouraged, especially with an overland vehicle, you're encouraged to take that off-road, take it out in the woods, you know, out in the sticks, and you know who knows what's going to happen. You can have... You know, you could have some body damage because, you know, most overlanding rigs are not, you know, on big tires or like 33s, 35s max. So it's like, you know, it's kind of interesting to see some of that stuff evolve um, from these, from like a factory option. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's weird. Like, so 20 grand for the Ram Runner. So let me just do some quick figures here. So if you're going to build a Raptor style, like pre runner type truck. So you're looking at about four grand on the low side for shocks. You're looking at about 1200 for a long travel 
like a pre-made long travel front end kit, long to mid. Like um, Brenthel has a line of products called um, Baja Kits. And I want to say their front end kit's about 1200 uh, fiberglass front fenders are about 350 to 500. Bedsides are 900. A set of like Deaver long travel rear leafs. I think you're looking at another seven or 800 for those. And then you got bumpers and stuff like that. You got to figure out. So. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if it'd be cheaper to go with a dealership or if it's cheaper to just do it on your own. Having that warranty coverage, though, that almost kind of seals the deal, though, doesn't it? Uh, to an extent, because some people are like, yeah, that warranty only lasts for so long. And, you know, sometimes the stuff wears out after the warranty is gone. So it's kind of like, OK, well, what was the point? You paid all this extra money for what? Um, there was another guy on YouTube that I follow. He gets asked a lot of questions because he had a fairly new truck and he put some like ridiculous lift on it. I want to say it was like a 12 inch bulletproof lift. Um, it was, that was the brand bulletproof. Uh, it was for a 2015, I want to say Chevy 2500. And, uh, he always got the question like, well, what about warranty? What about this? What about that? And he said, eh, he goes, you do know that they've broken down your warranty now that realistically you can do certain things to the vehicle and yeah it may avoid that section of the warranty and basically what it's come down to and I've been told this from a couple people that you know work in the dealership industry is basically it really comes down to the person writing the ticket so if you bring it in and let's say you got some you know you got a, it's lifted um, bigger tires and wheels, this, that, and the other. Well, if something fails on the interior, like let's say the heated seats go out and they no longer work. Well, realistically, did lifting it void that warranty? No. So if the ticket writer is actually sensible, they'll be like, okay, no problem. And they'll have the technician take a look at it and see what caused it and fix it. Now, if you you know, take that same vehicle in and let's say your ABS went out, you know, they're going to look at this thing and go, yeah, this thing's on like, you know, 40s and not what it rolled out of here with. There's no way we're fixing this because that voided the warranty. That's basically what I was told. It really comes down to the service rider. Huh. So maybe slip them a six pack or something. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know because it, like I said everything's different and I don't know it gets really weird because like um speaking from experience so on Michelle's Jeep um she opted to do the lifetime warranty. Um and I know it sounds crazy but uh I forget how, how it wasn't really that expensive either. I think it was an additional five or six grand on top of the vehicle. So I know to some people they're probably thinking like, well you're already gonna spend about, you know, you know, fifty grand on the vehicle and now you're gonna spend another on top of that. You know, that's kinda like a lot, but basically the lifetime warranty is very similar to what I was just saying. Everything on the vehicle is basically covered for life to an extent, meaning it still comes down to you playing Russian roulette with the service rider. Supposedly, if you go like, because obviously a Jeep is a vehicle you go off-road, and this was coming directly because I was sitting across the table from the guy when he said this, if you're out wheeling and let's say you roll over, you know, a fallen tree and one of the branches harpoons and goes up and clips your tranny line and all of a sudden you got fluid leaking everywhere blah 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 blah. you take it in because they said it is a vehicle that is designed to go off-road they will fix it because it was under that you know the having the lifetime warranty now he said where the gray line the gray area gets there is if you just bought the vehicle and let's say this happened two years three years or whatever after you bought the vehicle, they're saying, no, we can't because you didn't opt to get the lifetime. It was a really weird gray area, but they also gave you restrictions on what you could do. Like, for instance, she can't do anything over a two-inch lift, can't run tires bigger than 35s, um, 
there's like certain areas you cannot touch, otherwise it'll void the warranty. Wow. Yeah, there's like these warranties are starting to get really crazy. And like I said, some people are like, oh, it's just a paper. To some people, that paper is a security blanket. Like for me, having a new truck, it's nice because being that a diesel is more expensive to maintain than gas, if something goes out in the first couple of years, then I'm you know saved because they can take a look at it. Okay, yeah, that was the problem. It's only got X amount of miles. It's you know. And they'll take care of it. Whereas, you know, if you were to buy something off somebody else and you don't really know the maintenance of that vehicle, and now let's say like you spent all your hard earned cash on a truck that, you know, even though it's new, if something goes, you you're kind of stuck front in the bill. Right. So I don't know. Some people it, it is. Some people are like, yes, they they're all about the warranty, and then other people are like, I could take it or leave it. It's re I guess it's really the luck you've had and if you're willing to take that gamble. You know, it's funny talking about like real car warranties and stuff like that, because it made me think about like the people that try and get stuff warrantied when they buy like a SCX 10 to RTR or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's kind of, it's like, dude, you're talking, you know, like whatever, just, you know, buy a new rock slider or a set of mirrors or something like the amount of hassle you go through and everything. I mean, granted, there's some companies that are super, super good at handling warranty stuff and standing behind their stuff. But I mean, like, I, I don't know, I would never call customer service because I had leaky shocks or something out of the box. You know what I mean? Well, that's kind of like, yeah, I wouldn't either, because if you really think about it, these cars are designed to be taken off road and you know they're designed to be banged up against rocks they're going to see dirt they're going to see mud they're going to see rocks they're going to see tree branches whatever and it's like so if you're running your car and you're using your rock sliders for what they're designed for and all of a sudden one gets caught on something or it's or it scrapes up or whatever why would you go to the manufacturer saying oh i need a new one it got damaged well you were using it that's what it's meant for it's like you can't go and expect like them to like basically rebuild your car after you use it right yeah i know it's kind of funny like honestly i mean this like 100 percent honest abe here um the only thing that I have ever warranted on rc cars is electronics if something's happened well yeah i can see that but that, but that's it. Like anything else, I just don't care. Like leaky shocks, whatever, just rebuild them because you're probably going to want different oil in them anyways, so why not? Which actually kind of like – it's funny you brought that up because being um, the assistant team manager, I get a lot of questions from people for MKS um, about servos, and they all want to say – they all they usually all come with me with the same thing. Oh, I got a buddy. I'm trying to convince him on running MKS, you know, but they but they want to know if the, if the servos are waterproof. And it's like, you know, I know from dealing with them and running them that they can handle water pretty well. I have not had an issue, knock on wood, with any of my servos running through water. Now, I do got to say, one of my servos, and it would make sense, um, one of the cars I ran you know, did a trail run, there was some water, water crossings, whatever, I, I always treat my cars the same way, wash them, dry them, set them on the shelf. Well, this one sat for a couple months, and then I brought it down, and I noticed that, like, I couldn't freely turn the wheels left to right, and I'm going, man, that's really weird. I said, what's going on? I'm, you know, some, it's almost like something's locked up. Well, as soon as I put power to it, and I was turning the wheel, the servo, you know, moved back and forth, everything was fine, so it got me thinking. I said, well, they are metal gears, no one said that they were coated metal gears, so it's possible that the metal rusted and there was just enough rust that you couldn't turn it yourself, but once you set power to it, it broke it free. Um, but other than that, I've never had an issue. Um, I have had this conversation with Thomas numerous times, and it really does come down to warranty issues of why they won't label it waterproof because realistically – even if you waterproof it, if somebody does something they're not supposed to do with it and it fails, 
they're going to want to say, well, you said it was waterproof. Well, yeah, it was waterproof if, like, you know, under normal conditions. You decided to treat your thing like a U-boat and forge the river, <laughs> and, you know, it didn't really, like, it wasn't designed for that. I mean, then there's other people that say, or other companies that are trying to say, oh, it's waterproof, you can, you know, submarine the thing, and it's going to work. So, I don't know. Some people don't like, you know, in... They want it's like the same thing with the RC. They want to hear that, oh, it's waterproof, it's waterproof, like it's a safety blanket. You know? There's, yeah, exactly. There's precautions you can take to make your average electronics waterproof. And you don't need to pay that extra amount of money. Will it void the warranty? Possibly. But you probably won't ever have, if you do it right, you should never need a warranty because you're not gonna fry your electronics. Sure, exactly. So it's all the gamble you want to take. I I don't know, man. I'm not brave enough to just run through standing water like that. Like honestly, if it is higher than like my wheel nut, I'm not gonna drive through it usually. No, I should send you some of my videos then. You'd cringe. You know what I need to do, and I feel like I'm being a really terrible friend, but I need to just go through and watch a bunch of your videos and your um, YouTube channel videos for two chains and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff was, like, we haven't done it in a while. Obviously, this year's been a big, you know, right, um, right. show. But, uh, yeah, I uh, it was a lot of, like, just events. It wasn't so much, like, trail runs. I mean, there are a couple of those on there. But I think one of the best videos I ever got, and I really need to find it because I was trying to use it as a model because somebody was like, oh, I just don't trust it if, you know, you run through water. You know, is it going to last? And all this, that, and the other. We were at, I think it was the first ASD crawl. No, the second ASD crawl. So the first one at the, um, the is it Rains Off-Road Park? Frank Rains Off-Road Park. Um, we were out there, and there was, like, this little, like, I guess you can say creek or something. Like, it was just, like, this little, like, body of water. They had built a bridge, and it was super funny. So Elio, Todd, and I th – who else was there? I think – was it Ben? It was like three of us. Or maybe – yeah, it was like – all I know is it was like three or four of us. They, those three were going across the bridge, and Elio being Mr. like scale director guy was trying to get all down low and film, and he was trying to get the perfect shot. And I was like, how can I photobomb this? So I drove into the water and went – the long way down the creek, and I was running my um, tow truck, all you could see was the boom out of the water. It looked like an RC shark just going underneath the bridge. Well, <laughs> he was trying to get his scale shot going over the bridge. It was hilarious. And all you see is this wake coming behind the boom. It was it was funny. But I, I've told you, I submerged that thing, drove it all the way under, drove it out, and – I let it sit out in the – I mean I drove it obviously all the way back to the truck, and then I let it sit out in the sun because it was like 110 degrees, and I I haven't had any issues. And I waterproofed those electronics myself. No kidding. Mm-hmm. So I know like Tekken stuff says it's element proof, like that's kind of the terminology that they choose. But, I mean, I still don't really tempt fate just because <laughs> – you, you know what I mean? Like it, it's just – I don't know. It, it's hard to just – do stuff like that where it's such a huge gamble of possibly ruining something. I mean, servos are, you know, it, it's way probably the servo is probably like the easiest thing you could possibly waterproof on an RC car. Mm -hmm. You know, receivers a little more involved. DSC is quite a bit more involved, but I don't know. I mean, that's really the only part I think that I'm comfortable letting get any kind of moisture near it is the servo just for that reason. I mean, I've seen guys, you know, smear some shoe goo or silicone on the mating surfaces of the case and then take a O-ring and put grease on it and put that over the output shaft and then suck the uh, servo horn down over the top of it. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of ways that you can make a servo fairly waterproof, but, like, anything else, it just seems like too much of a gamble. Mm. See, I've always – maybe I like to live life on the edge, but – we know that you do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
uh, like for for me, waterproofing um, ESCs and receivers if they don't come already claimed to be waterproof, um, I typically just take them apart. It's really fairly simple. Um, like I'll get the the main board out of the receiver, and then I'll take like for instance the CowRC conformal coating, and I'll just and the beauty of that stuff is it comes almost like a nail polish, so it's got a little brush, just kind of like put a thick coat on each side just kind of coat the entire thing so it's like all one piece and then let it dry put it back in the case I've put a little uh, dielectric grease um, like I guess the best way to, to, to do it is I get a little of the grease on my finger and I take the end of your um, receiver plugs and kind of just dab them on there and then just stick it right down into the um, you know, into the receiver, so that way it's just enough to where it coats everything, so you're not, not like making a big mess, but enough to where you're keeping the water away from the contact, because really what will happen if you don't is, if you get any kind of rust on those pins, the connection will be bad, um, it's not so much that it's going to like short it out or anything, it's just you're really going to get bad connection, so that's why I do it, and then with the ESC is kind of the same thing. I, I used to do it way back when I ran um, Tekken. I, I used to take the RX-4s apart all the time, and I'd do the same thing. Conformal coat the board, put it back together, and then I'd actually put silicone. I'd do a dab of silicone over each of the buttons and let it dry. Done. Man, I've submerged, and I beat the crap out of all those, and they keep going. So, quick public service announcement. Mm -hmm. If you guys, listeners, not you guys, because you guys already know this, but if uh, if you're looking at running in any kind of water, at dielectric grease that Adam's talking about, everybody should have some of that if you are a scale crawler. That stuff is, it comes in so handy because it's it's non-conductive, that's the reason why, but it, it's like kind of a clearish white, almost like, um, it almost kind of looks like Vaseline, but maybe a little more white. And uh, that stuff is awesome to do your um, sensor plugs, especially if you have a <laughs> brushless system, do those. Um, do anywhere that there's a wire connection coming into anything just for an added layer of protection. Um, and on, it's really good for a lot of other stuff too. Like one of the things I use it for, cause I don't know with you working in construction, I'm sure this has probably happened to you like a million times, Adam, but like you ever go to replace a light bulb in your house and you break the stinking glass and leave the metal socket in. Mm hmm. I put dielectric grease on all the threads whenever I replace a light bulb just because it makes life so much easier. Yeah. No, it's the same thing. You can use that stuff not only with that. You can also use it in um, automotive, like when you're putting your light bulbs. Like actually now, if, if uh, I don't know if any of our listeners mess around with their actual rigs, but like on a lot of the newer vehicles, and I, I want to say it started like in the mid to late 2000s, I've noticed that like – when you're taking light bulbs out, like if you okay, let's say the turn signal blows out, when you take it out and you see that grease on there, that's the dielectric grease. That's the grease to help keep the, the water and the moisture out from having an issue. So they have, that's why they recommend you putting it back on when you're putting the brand new one in. It just kind of aids in keeping everything kind of like sealed up. So that stuff, it, it works really well. So yeah, I actually pick my stuff up from Home Depot. It actually comes in a a can with like a nozzle and you can actually adjust the amount that comes out like you can uh, you can change it to like a lot and when you barely um, squeeze down on the trigger it just like comes out and then you can actually tone it down and just have a little bit come out and then you can easily um, apply it where you need I was just going to ask you something about th oh do you use a little pressurized can that you like push your finger on the nozzle to tilt it and it comes out is that what you use so it's similar to that uh, it's got like almost like a lever and when you adjust that when you adjust how much comes out that lever actually raises up or gets closer to the can which I guess is their way of regulating the pressure gotcha okay how are we doing for time we're do getting we close get away from us oh yeah hour 44 yeah we're close Nice. Well, 
for the sake of having other stuff to do, I guess we should probably say goodbye unless there's anything else you guys wanted to go over. Uh, no, that was really about it. I know we like we got we got to touch on bodies, uh, gave a little life lesson or I guess learning experience on um, the different Jeep bodies and the package from Dodge. Yeah. Um, oh, um, so when we post this on Facebook, everybody, what what would be really cool, and who knows, you may forget because there's more important things in life than RC, but what would be really cool is the guys like Wes Braswell and the Todd Nortons and those guys that we know are really talented with doing RC body work. If you guys, when we post this, post the link to the show on Friday morning on Facebook. If you guys would care to like chime in and share some of your secrets or links to any materials that you use or anything like that, that would be really awesome to share some of that knowledge with the public because I mean, obviously there's a lot to know about it and all we did was share with you guys what we know and I know there's way more out there than just what we know. So, um, yeah, so if it, everybody could kind of get involved and, you know, throw out some ideas and helpful hints and stuff like that, that would be really cool, and you'd probably help a lot of people out too. Agreed. Yep. So anyways, well, I guess we better get going here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Um we're trying really hard to get John Holmes to come on the show. So if you happen to be friends with him, maybe give him a little poke in the ribs and say, Hey, those guys would really like to have you on the show and interview you. So maybe he'll cave, uh, under some peer pressure here. So, um, yeah. So aside from that, um, have a great weekend. You guys, hopefully you can get out and enjoy some tiny trucking. Sweet. See you guys. See you. Guys. See you.